Good? OK. Hi, welcome back to Monroe Live. I'm Julian Ates. I'm joined by Antonio Denano. And uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the Hyundai Ionic 5 battery pack. We've got it upside down right now. Uh, there are a few things we want to talk about structure related before we get into the architecture of the modules inside the pack, how the bus bar, high voltage and low voltage uh, systems were, were routed. Um, so what we're seeing right now, uh, I believe it may have been visible in one of the hoist reviews that we did for the vehicle. Uh, this is an SMC cover cl closing out the bottom portion of the battery pack. Uh, we had to remove this with a series of fasteners and also a good bit of structural adhesive both around the perimeter and around uh, any areas where there was a bolt going up mid-pack up to the body. If we remove this cover, we find that there are, uh, bring it over your way. We find that uh, what is the first production example since the ID4 we've had in house, uh, this is an integrated cold plate into the base of the battery pack. So if we look up front, we can actually see that there are two coolant ports, one for inlet, one for outlet, exterior to the pack. And those made with the cold plate, <clears throat> this is a two piece uh, stamped and brazed aluminum plate that is friction stir welded around the perimeter to the pack frame. And this flows the coolant, the ethylene glycol, in a serpentine path across the pack and then back out. So we don't see this uh, very often. However, there are some innate advantages to having your cold plate integral to the structure of the pack. Uh, for one, uh, like we see with the Mach-E or the Lightning, or even uh, more recently with the Lucid or the Hummer, discrete cold plates can either be integral to the module structure or they can be installed separately. Uh, they have additional fasteners. Ideally, they'd be co-located and clamped down with the fasteners used to attach the modules. Uh, but oftentimes there's additional processing and cost that's associated with having them be discrete inside the pack. Uh, with this execution, you are also eliminating the uh, redundant layering of material. So for a cold plate, you'd have the two sheets that are braised together, similar to what we have here, and those would then sit on top of the existing sheet uh, that would serve as the floor of the battery pack. So we are getting rid of some redundant material, so there's going to be uh, some weight advantages there. Uh, however, one thing to factor in is you do need to have some form of protection for uh, stone impingement uh, while factoring in ground clearance, which is what the SMC cover was doing. It provides an air gap between any of the channels through which the coolant's flowing. Uh, therefore, there is some level of protection that's needed, so it's not as simple as just making the bottom of the pack the cold plate. Uh, there are some additional components that uh, need to be integrated. I'd also like to add in, it reduces the potential for an internal leak path. So by having no connections from the cold plate to the modules as an individual case, um, all your connections are external, so there's no chance of coolant leaking into your module and into your batteries. So less of a failure mode that way. Right, and there's an assembly advantage to that. Uh, having no nylon lines inside, all you have to do is drop the modules in and secure your low and high voltage connections and the pack is assembled. Uh, and yeah, there's fewer leak paths. Uh, innately it would have some safety advantages to it as well. Uh, so from the underside, uh, the last two things to touch on is the existence of just uh, safety access panel or service access panels, pardon me, uh, both in the front and the rear of the pack. So up here we would have access to our primary uh, battery management system uh, control board. And in the rear, this is where we have a uh, mid-pack fuse. Uh, so there's a large ceramic fuse as opposed to a pyro switch. Uh, in the rear here, uh, so this would be between the two halves of the pack where they're connected via the copper bus bars. Uh, so with that, I think we can flip it over and look a little bit at what's uh, inside. This video is sponsored by Anchor and their 625 solar panels. The Anchor 625 solar panel is compatible with their Powerhouse 521, 535, and 757 portable power stations, making it an ideal all-in-one power solution for road trips, camping trips, RVs, and more. It features a foldable and portable design and is scratch and weather resistant to last as long as your adventures do. The lightweight solar panel features a USB-C and a USB-A output port to charge two devices at the same time. 
Equipped with Anchor's proprietary suncast technology, the solar panel converts up to 23% of sunlight into solar energy, charging your solar generators even on cloudy days. Short circuit and overvoltage protection will keep you and your devices safe, and the built-in kickstand enables you to position your panel to get optimal sunlight. When you're done charging, just fold the panels and bring them everywhere you go. Visit anchor.com today. Click the link below and use the discount code for additional savings. Okay. Uh, so now we can see the inside of the pack as it would be right side up uh, as dropped from the vehicle. The construction of this is very aluminum extrusion heavy. Uh, this is something that we also see with uh, other vehicles like the F-150 Lightning uh, or the Mustang Mach-E. The Volkswagen ID.4 had some similar construction to this as well. Lucid, um, even though the tray was fiberglass. Right, so even though Lucid did have the fiberglass base to it, uh, a lot of the structure for the frame is done in largely the same way uh, with the aluminum extrusions. Uh, there's a lot of uh, TIG welding going on inside the pack that appears to be fairly manual, which uh, was somewhat surprising given the fact that this is part of the uh, eGMP platform for Hyundai. So this is also going to be present in Kia products. So the volumes that uh, this particular pack structure would be produced in, it uh, doesn't look quite as optimized for volume production as we would have anticipated. Um, However, there are uh, some uh, notable things here in terms of their fastening strategy to touch on. Namely, by uh, the aluminum extrusions surrounding the perimeter uh, are using rib nuts to allow the fasteners from the lid to thread into them. The F-150 Lightning and the Mach-E had actually used a thicker wall on the uh, upper portion of the extruded profile so they could tap into the aluminum directly. Uh, the rib nuts uh, can be fairly costly as commodities, especially when used in the quantities seen in the entire pack. Uh, the other alternative would be to thicken up that extrusion uh, to, you know, we've seen nine millimeters on the Lightning, uh, which can be prohibitive in terms of mass and cost. So one thing that the ID4 did was they used thermal flow screws as a way to alleviate the need to thicken that wall and also not need uh, the rib nuts here. In terms of sealing, we have a large injection molded seal with uh, manually installed compression limiters. A uh, seal like this tends to be uh, fairly costly as well as it's, uh, as can be imagined, just seeing Antonio and I holding it here in terms of installation. Uh, it certainly is not the uh, most assembly process friendly execution for a battery pack. And we are seeing a trend away from injection molded seals like this. Uh, however, Antonio, depending on the pack uh, safety uh, mechanisms in place being uh, pressure relief vents in the pack elsewhere, the, the seal actually does uh, play a role in that system, correct? Right. Something we've actually learned a good bit about since the Hummer pack teardown is uh, the safety consideration for the internal pressures of uh, thermal runaway control. So this gasket is designed to uh, pop uh, loosen itself in the event of a thermal event to allow gases to escape. So they don't have it as a bust of a thermal um, venting strategy as say the Hummer pack, which had uh, gaskets and um, vents on each module location. I mean, this is a fairly, this type of seal is fairly common uh, when we look at a lot of hybrid battery pack application. This true. is almost exclusively uh, what we've seen from various hybrid packs that we've torn down. Uh, however, there is a trade-off. This is innately going to be more cost intensive. There's a lot of manual labor both in the assembly uh, of the seal with the compression limiters as well as installation to the pack. Primarily what we've seen with uh, everything Tesla's done is always a liquid applied seal around the perimeter uh, between the tray and lid clamshell. Um, the uh, Mach-E and uh, F-150 Lightning with their SMC lid uh, had a channel uh, embedded within the lid for a, uh, a seated uh, rubber gasket that didn't have any compression limiters present in it. Uh, so what we would typically recommend from a cost perspective would be a liquid applied seal. However, given, as Antonio had mentioned, uh, there is ribbing present on the seals 
and uh, a function of how the seal geometry is designed is in the event of uh, you know, over pressure inside the pack due to off gassing. These can actually allow some of that pressure to escape the pack uh, when there is not a larger pressure relief valve like we've seen in the Tesla. Um, so this does kind of play a role into the ventilation strategy. So there are trade-offs. This is more cost and manually process intensive, but it sort of doubles as your thermal uh, venting strategy. If you go for a liquid applied, you do have to invest in uh, strategically placed uh, pressure vents elsewhere in the pack. Um, right, especially with like an RTV, which is a really pain to remove. Right, yeah, and it's this is more service friendly. That's another aspect, and a lot of this pack was designed, as you can see from the two uh, service access panels that we pointed out on the underside, there was a consideration for service in this pack. So that's likely driving the decision to go for a more costly seal. However, uh, we do get into the bait fairly often about what exactly is the likelihood and how often these packs are actually getting opened up to have a single module serviced. I believe we'll have some B-roll of the pack when it was still fully assembled. And typically the way these things are laid out when you open them, getting a single module out usually is not a super simple uh, task. Uh, therefore, we would call into question exactly how necessary some of the uh, service requirements would be. Whereas um, this pack was kind of e one of the easier ones to get a module out of. It was. So uh, again, uh, because we don't have any coolant lines running internal to the pack, and we can move the seal here. Because we don't have any coolant lines running internal to the pack, effectively, once we removed the bus bars and the low voltage harnesses, the modules were placed uh, inside with a layer of thermal interface material, which I'd like to bring out here. This is the uh, entire quantity of thermal interface material removed from the pack. You can see the witness marks from where the pouch cells interface directly with that, which we'll talk a little bit about when we get to the module design. Uh, this is uh, silicone-based TIM or thermal interface material, similar to uh, what we see in the Mach-E and the Lightning. And rather than take a Mach-E approach where a selective application would be uh, on the base of the pack, uh, this was essentially entirely covering the areas here where the modules resided. So there were four modules in each of these chambers, and there was complete coverage uh, with Tim in each one of those. So for the entire pack, this was about 10 kilograms uh, in total of thermal interface material, and it's not an uncostly material. Therefore, uh, both the coverage you have as well as the thickness, uh, this is uh, also one of the thicker uh, applications of thermal interface material we've seen about three millimeters. Uh, that does add up in cost significantly and it can add some fairly decent mass to the, the pack. This as dropped was about 485 kilograms and 10 of that was just for the thermal interface material. Um, one additional thing that I'd like to point out because it was something we touched on in the Hummer video was where the modules interface with the cold plate here we do see that there are uh, bossed raised sections in the stamping. This is likely, uh, and this is just uh, a theory, uh, to accommodate uh, proper volume of flow underneath the modules. However, what we discussed with the Hummer was that for an application like this, you typically want as flat of a profile as possible where you have a tim layer and your modules going against the cold plate. Because they have these raised sections, it's very likely driving a lot of that three millimeter thickness that we're seeing with the uh, thermal interface material. Uh, so the exact reason for this, I can only uh, assume would have been for a uh, flow rate uh, related issue. Uh, however, it does necessitate that you have a thicker layer of tim to get even coverage around the, uh, the bottom of the pouches. So um, that's another trade off there that could have been to avoid uh, impeding on ground clearance by bringing the stampings on the lower portion of the pack lower. Um, we're not exactly at liberty to say for sure. Um, not to mention, because it's fluid, it's a good place to take care of your tolerance stacking issues. Um, so your bolts, your riv nuts, everything that goes into it, um, they might not line up perfectly. If you have a fluid interface, you can fill that more or less to have, make sure you have no gaps in your uh, space between two things. There's also the um, steel cross member that goes across the middle of the module, so that might be a good place for it to line up to prevent any rubbing issues. And we do have one of the modules here, so we can show roughly, this is gonna be upside down from its orientation in pack. 
and this has been discharged and uh, taped off. We have plexiglass covering the pouches themselves. However, uh, this area here, we can see that there is the single strap that Antonio mentioned going across the bottom. These sections of the pouch cells were actually directly embedded within the thermal interface material, uh, as opposed to what we see with the Mach-E, which uh, initially had a uh, sort of a hockey stick shaped stamping that made contact between two of the cells and came down to make contact with the cold plate. And the lightning, which enclosed its cells entirely within a stamped steel clamshell with a layer of thermal interface inside, then the layer of uh, aluminum, I'm sorry, uh, and then another layer of thermal interface material below that, and then the cold plate. Uh, there's a lot of layers stacking up uh, between that when ideally your system would have the cells directly against the cold plate, but since there's uh, you know, not a effective way to maintain or ensure good surface area contact, a layer of tim is there to, as Antonio mentioned, kind of make up those tolerance gaps. But the thinner, the better. Uh, the th thicker the tim layer gets, the more you're actually impeding your ability to conduct heat out of your modules. So um, this is uh, definitely for thermal uh, uh, performance. This is an effective way to do it. However, then having a three millimeter layer thick uh, tim uh, application below it uh, is not as optimal as it potentially could be. Uh, in terms of the high and low voltage circuits, which we'll touch on briefly before we get into the module construction. <clears throat> As uh, part of the EGMP platform for Hyundai, uh, this was also designed both for service and scalability in mind. As such, uh, each one of these sections can hold an array of four modules that are linked together uh, with some unique fastening methods that Antonio will touch on in a minute. Uh, in terms of their BMS strategy, they had a series of Mobis units that were located along the center spine extrusion of the pack. They were cartridge loaded and secured in place. And so there were eight total inside the pack. Uh, and they would collect the data from the low voltage harnesses for both temperature and voltage sensing. Uh, they would connect uh, from the module array to one connector and then a second connector would run to the primary BMS unit which would be located here in the vehicle. Uh, so those ran all the way along the center spine and they used a common harness for each array of modules. However, depending on uh, extended or standard ranges, uh, these areas can be decontented. Uh, so instead of four, you may have two in a certain section. And as such, you could, uh, in theory, uh, if you eliminated an entire row, like Lucid has done uh, for their uh, foot garage that they call it, um, you could, in theory, delete two of those BMS units and uh, eight of the modules inside one section. Um, so as far as the high voltage is concerned, we did also have a series of copper bus bars inside the uh, battery pack. These are all plated and coated, uh, fairly standard, competitively speaking. The main thing uh, that is curious, uh, simply from a cost perspective, is that we do see a trend toward aluminum bus bars, uh, not completely adopted yet. Uh, however, most recently with Lucid, which was an 800 volt pack, much like this Ionic 5 battery, they did uh, utilize entirely aluminum bus bars right. uh, throughout all of their module to module connections. And primarily what you, the concern is between copper and aluminum is uh, you do have to grow your cross section uh, for the same ampacity for using aluminum versus copper. Uh, but it's also, it has different thermal cycling properties. So where you need to make a bolt connection between modules or to your power distribution unit, to any of your contactors, anything that might be critical or safety related, you wanna make sure that the thermal cycling is not gonna relax that bolt clamp load too much. And aluminum, that rate of relaxation can be twice that of copper, which means that for a lot of 400 or four 400 volt applications, uh, the only places we've seen uh, aluminum bus bars used, such as the Model S Plaid, they friction stir welded a copper bus bar end uh, where they were going to have that clamp load so they could utilize the cost and weight savings of the aluminum across the length of it and then uh, maintain their clamp loads at the ends by selectively using copper. The Lucid, on the other hand, used aluminum entirely throughout the pack, uh, potentially uh, leveraging the 800 volt architecture and the uh, lower current that everything would be running at. It's highly likely, but not in any way confirmed that what allowed them to do that was the 800 volt architecture. 
the lower current thermally cycling the aluminum less, uh, thus giving them less concerns about that clamp load relaxing everywhere they bolted the connections between uh, modules. So. <clears throat> uh, so between the individual modules themselves, uh, we had these smaller bus bars. Uh, there were three of these present in each array. Uh, so we'd have a solid bus bar on the outer sides and then between the four of them directly in the middle, they had uh, this bus bar with a uh, integrated fusible link. So in the event of uh, any kind of uh, overcurrent, uh, this would actually be able to cut any one of these module arrays in half. Uh, therefore, that's a, a pretty neat way to uh, integrate a feature like that. And they do also include, uh, there's a, uh, some visibility for the fusible link. So for service purposes, it's uh, fairly easy to identify if this has been uh, blown effectively or not uh, without having to open that up. So uh, that was something that was uh, kind of a nice little uh, feature integration there. Yeah, it was a good find. <clears throat> uh, so with that, Antonio, I think we've talked enough about the pack architecture at large. Do we want to go into a little bit about the cells and the modules? Sure, let's go into the cells and the modules. Modules are some of the smaller ones we've ever seen. They are 2P6S, which mentions it right on it. Um, the cells themselves are kind of in the middle of what we've seen. They are a little thinner than the lightning cells, but a little longer. And they are about the same thickness as the Hummer um, Ultium cell, but maybe half the size, a little bit longer than that. So um, one of the neat features from the modules is this over lay um, cross hatching with the terminal connect or um, bolt connections. So when the modules are laying side by side, these actually overlap. If I have it correct, there we go. So you use one bolt to connect two modules together, which is a nice um, cost save, um, part save. It's easier manufacturing. So that's a nice feature we've seen. Um, the module itself is two steel plates on either side, a polymer cover. This is probably for thermal. So if, um, if you have a two in case, it just becomes a pressure case, pressure container, which you don't want. So you have ventilation, you have paths for your low voltage connections. Um, and everything is held together with these uh, small metal bonds on the top and bottom. And there's places for thermal connector, or thermistors to go into the module on the top and on the bottom as well. So how many modules and cells were there total in the pack? So this is a 32 module pack, uh, each being 2P6S is a 12 cell module. Um, comparatively, um, when we opened it up, we have our uh, contact adhesive base separators, our anodes and cathodes, and our separators. So the separators, this is a Z-stacking application in the cell. Um, Lightning used Z-stacking, Hummer used standard stacking. Um, so Z-folding Z actually is a back and forth where you insert one come up and start the other side. So it's a continuous process, um, whereas the Hummer is kind of like stacking pancakes after you make them. Um, this comparatively per kilowatt hour to cells, these two are pretty close together. This one is about 10% off above the other cells. And we're contributing that because it's the same chemistries roughly, um, same assembly, there's pouch cells, it's not a, a cylindrical to prismatic comparison. Um, the main difference is the stacking method and we're going to attribute that difference to the process. So effectively that means that the Z folding as opposed to the Z stacking or where you have stacking. a, or st yeah, standard stacking as a, you know, with a continuous layer of separator film as opposed to discrete pieces stacked like a pancake, uh, you know, that would be attributed to about a 10% cost per kilowatt hour delta. Right. Um, the terminals themselves are pretty standard, nothing special. Uh, they do have a weld on the side, which was a little 
fun when I was disassembling it. The little circuit boards here are just your internal voltage balancing. So there's uh, some resistors in there, which is the smallest, most compact uh, battery management plan that we've seen for any of the modules. And it goes to a rather simple um, battery management board in the center of the spine. So simple strategy. I like that. Um, when we think back again to the Lucid where the, uh, the battery management system ran the entire length of the module. Um, compact is nice. Does it do everything the Lucid board does? Probably not. Does it need to? Good question. Okay, so uh, I think we've covered just about everything. Antonio, was there anything else from the modules or the pack as an assembly that we still wanted to touch on? I think we've hit all the issues. Um, I mean, it's, it's designed to be modular. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, in all, uh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, fairly competitive in terms of design. Uh, we do see many packs uh, constructed with extruded aluminum uh, and stampings. The integral cold plate, I think for me, is one of the highlights of this pack design. Uh, that's the kind of integration that uh, we definitely like to see uh, taking a bunch of discrete components and redundant layers of material and consolidating that all into one. Uh, so as far as that's concerned, I uh, definitely uh, do think that this pack design in general is uh, yeah, really, really, uh, really kind of slick in some areas. So, aside from like the material, like getting the the pack assembled, I think the design for assembly is probably pretty high on this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, largely, uh, I think that that just about covers it. So, uh, thank you all for watching, uh, and uh, stay tuned for the next time. Thank you.